questions from the audience as well. Um, to kick us off, we've heard uh, just ground rules, I suppose. Uh, you can pass if you'd like, but we'll try to share the mic and hear from as many speakers as want to contribute per question. You mean we can pass on a question? You can pass on a question. Good, good clarification. <laughs> and, you, and you can pass the mic as well. Um, so, so based on what we've heard today in each of your presentations, and picking up maybe less on what you said around um, the urgency of, um, of addressing some of the community's um, commercial and retail needs. Where do you think the greatest opportunities for, or not West, but anyone, where do you think the, the greatest opportunities for collaboration are and, and in the short term? How would you, uh, how would you like to go forward? Dare I spell that? <laughs> Um, you know, I know that we only recently passed the downtown Eastside local area plan and things like the Chinatown Historic Area Hike Review. Uh, but I think as readily as legally possible, because I know that it does introduce a whole can of worms if we start changing zoning when properties have been purchased and invested on and whatnot, I do think we need, desperately need to reset. There's certainly a lot of things that we're seeing coming out of the, 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 the hike rezoning in Chinatown that's having negative impacts on the uh, neighborhood. Uh, things like Let Go Industrial Areas and Colossus and the DEOD. And I think we may, uh, it may be a good time to, to give a little pause and maybe a bit of a rethink on what's a, a serious policy decision that, that may have uh, lasting repercussions. I mean, things have been moving so quickly since the passing of the Downtown Eastside Local Area Plan. And I mean, just the other day, I found out that my doctor's office at the Chinatown Medical Clinic, uh, he's moving out because that building's been sold. And that's part of the land assembly for a massive rezoning on Gore in Georgia there. And uh, you know, I know plans for the hospital include seeing Gore as a high street, so I worry what's gonna happen to Gore Avenue. Uh, all this stuff that is coming down the pipes, and I think that we need to, uh, if, if at all possible, if at all legally possible, we need to do a radical rethink. Uh, and at least pause, put, hit the pause button before things go too far off, as they may already be. Yeah, um, I totally agree with Peter that um, we do need to rethink how we uh, maintain the livability of our neighborhoods, especially in the downtown east side and Chinatown. And uh, the part of the reason why we uh, wanted to look into historic data is uh, for a lot of us youth, we hear, or uh, like I didn't grow up in Chinatown per se, but since I operated that space, um, like how do, what, what was it like back in the day that a lot of people want to see come back? And for us, it's, uh, the development pressures has definitely um, put a lot of strain on these businesses. And simply because they work in a more informal as well as parallel economy uh, doesn't mean that they're not important because they still continue to serve the neighborhood. Um, so how do we make the development and social, economic, and cultural needs uh, all balanced out? I think it's, uh, we really need to put a price tag to that so we can compete with real estate, I think. Um, I think you already said what I was thinking, but uh, gentrification is happening really rapidly at the Dalton East side, and we're really worried about the big condo development going down on East Hastings, over by Campbell Avenue, that's going to change that area radically, and I think everyone in CK, we're just worried that the whole Dalton East side is going to end up like around Woodward's, and it's going to go fast too, if no measures are taken to stop gentrification right now. <laughs> Um, so the question is about partnerships. Okay, yeah, so um, uh, there's some examples I think in other cities. You know, oftentimes I think we um, we turn to government at any various level to you know come through with some sort of a, a response and there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of things that local government does and can't do, but uh, at the same time there are some really innovative community investment responses in the US um, community land trusts that have been formed in Boston and Chicago. Uh, in New York and in Minneapolis, there are um, community real estate investment cooperatives that are forming specifically to protect, to buy and protect, and in some cases redevelop uh, in a democratized way uh, in community retail and commercial spaces. So I think in Vancouver, I just um, I put that out as an invitation to the community to look at these things and think about you know um, what you can do with the resources that you have or are the resources you can drive and. and uh, because I think that it comes out of ownership, and if if uh, if there's no if there's if local ownership is eroded by a 
globalized real estate market makes it very hard to form partnerships sometimes when you have to deal with someone who's in a, an office in, in New York or, or London or Shanghai or wherever they might be. And so, um, so protecting local ownership, uh, whether it's um, um, businesses or residents or, or uh, resident cooperatives, these sort of things are, are uh, I think, underexplored in Vancouver at this point and could be an interesting way of, of um, an investment way, you know, engaging with other institutions like Van City, we always wanted to CCEC has a great uh, history of, of community investment too on commercial drive. I think those things can also be explored. Great. Do any of the other panelists want to respond to Wes? I can see some heads going. I don't think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> actually, great. Well, I would quickly just responding to Maria actually. Uh, just just with, within the context of gentrification, uh, one of the things that I've heard from a lot of the small businesses is that they're afraid of gentrification too. So especially a lot of the production and manufacturing, I mean, we think of gentrification as an imposed business thing on, on, on poor people, but a lot of the production and manufacturing businesses, they are very afraid. Uh, I've talked to a few of them who, not just in light of the property assessments going up, but in light of the fact that certain areas are being rezoned for significantly more density than their, than their single-story cinder block level you know, workshop is, is, is currently allowing, uh, they're afraid because their landlords are like, hey, you know what, I'm not going to renew your lease because I can sell this and I can build a five, six, whatever story on top of it uh, with residential and, uh, yeah, this just is a viable. And there's nowhere left for them to go. And that's the real fear for a lot of them is that they don't even know where in the lower mainland they can go, let alone what part of the province they're going to go. So, uh, you know, definitely something to think about because once those guys are gone, then we'll be uh, much the poorer for it. Okay, so based on what we've heard, and um, you're pulling this up a little bit, but how, how might a new developer or a business owner um, engage with the community in order to ensure alignment with, um, with retail priorities? Or how might we um, provide innovative sort of responses or work with the development sector to, to come up with some better outcomes? Any ideas? So, you know, sometimes when we look at the, 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 the public benefit strategies that came with the various local area plans that have been passed in the last few years, so Grandview Woodland, uh, West End, Downtown East Side, we see that the lion's share of public benefits for the Downtown East Side go for housing. And of course, housing is a critical need in our, in our community. But it begs, you know, the, the question needs to be asked, you know, if we're putting all the housing in this community, why aren't public benefits from other communities paying for that? Because it seems that those public benefits going into housing are then robbing us of benefits for community services like community centers, like parks. Uh, even maybe we can start looking at, at, at local serving retail as a, as a community amenity and as an actual contribution. So it's not just about extracting public benefits in the form of, of, of low-income housing, but it's extracting public benefits in the form of low-income serving businesses and that kind of thing. And I think we really, really need a radical rethink. And I think when we look at the public benefit schemes in other neighborhoods, and it's going to building parks and swimming pools and all sorts of fancy, I think we need to maybe start looking at ways to, to, to pull from other neighborhoods into our neighborhood uh, to bring a, a little bit of equity because I think it's, it's, it's unburdened right now. And that might be a little bit controversial in every other neighborhood but here, but I think it's a conversation that needs to happen. Yes. I get that, like the provocative answer, which is if you're not going to, you know, sell things that are affordable to people in this community, then don't open your shop in this community, you know? I think it's as simple as that. Like, if you're going to sell coffees for $5, if you use bottles for $10, just, I don't know, choose another location. Because you're in the poorest neighborhood in Canada, there's 1,000 people who are sleeping on the streets every night, and, you know, um, and thousands, over 10,000 people are on welfare and pension rates. Like, if you want to sell like high-end stuff, this is not your neighborhood. So in terms of the, the developers, one of the things the city has done recently is we've been piloting what's called a neighborhood fit tool, a neighborhood fit uh, bulletin. And uh, so if for a few of different inquiries that we've had, um, a business or developer will come in and say, I'm thinking about doing something, and then we'll refer them to that. And what that is is a list of um, different types of impacts that they can potentially have. So one of those questions are, do you sell things that are affordable to you know, low-income residents? 
uh, hard to quantify that, of course, but uh, you know, basically, are you socially inclusive of the local population? Do you hire locally? You know, what are the other ways in which you give back to the community or engage with the community? Uh, and I think, you know, in terms of just, it, it, it doesn't necessarily have a lot of teeth at this point, um, but it's a new tool for us to work with and continue to develop. And if anything, it wakes them up sometimes, I think, to the fact that, oh, wait a minute, we do have, you know, we do have an impact here. And in some cases, one of them was really interested in knowing how they could work on the employment side of things. And so we put them in touch with some local employment services groups who had some skills there. And, and uh, so it's it's um, it's something new and something that we're, we're applying. And, uh, you know, we hope there's potential to, to continue to develop that. But uh, I encourage you guys, if you see an inquiry for development or for uh, a new business, you know, get in touch with that person. Get, get in touch with, uh, you know, if you see something, call. And uh, I think that more often than not, uh, the ground floor space, you know, uh, they'll lease it for a certain rate because obviously they're trying to make uh, a profit, uh, but, um, or they're just trying not to lose money, you know, on, on the space. But so uh, with, with new tools like, like Ceres, um, the economics of that space potentially change. We can do some interesting things there. So when new developments come in, you know, maybe there's potential uh, to continue growing that as a sort of lease trust, if you will, to protect those spaces. So it has potential, we're gonna to continue to explore it. So other groups other than BC Housing could put properties into that serious space? Well, there's nothing to say that couldn't happen. So I think there's, there's plenty of potential to explore where it goes. And if, uh, if we continue hearing ideas from the community, we feed into that, you know, it's a new tool we have at our disposal that we previously didn't. Thanks for pointing out the framework. I think, uh, especially um, in Chinatown, with the new developments on uh, the corners of uh, Kiefer and Main, so Kiefer Block and 180 Kiefer, the, the businesses that have gone in uh, has kind of uh, irked a lot of community members, uh, as to say, a uh, crosstown dentist, uh, kind of erasing Chinatown from the name, and also the Delina, which was mentioned earlier, uh, with a security guard. And uh, I went into Delina when they opened, and uh, their prices, some of it's uh, above the same pricing as Whole Foods, but there are items that are more expensive than Whole Foods. So that kind of puts it uh, into perspective of like, is it serving the current community or is it introducing a new socioeconomic class that is gentrifying the neighborhood? Uh, and I do know that certain folks in the room, Edmund, who's our landlord and good friend over there, for example, has been doing a lot of work with new businesses to try and figure out like signage. Uh, are there other ways, uh, economic models that businesses can adopt to welcome uh, Chinese seniors into their businesses? Uh, so, uh, how do we work with uh, new and old businesses? And, uh, for example, there's a lot of people that might not like Bao Bay and Kiss the uh, but the little known fact is that Bao Bay, before Chinatown Supermarket closed, bought pretty much exclusively for fresh produce from Chinatown Supermarket. Uh, so that's one way that they were supporting the local economy. It's not the best solution, but at least they were trying in some ways. So there's a lot of tactical uh, implementation as businesses, I think, that we can look into as a community. What else can the business community do to um, do more to uh, affect the poverty and homelessness that we're, that we're experiencing in the next side? You spoke a little bit about that. Well, I, I mean, I think, that, and, and, and Maria and Wes have both touched on this, and I think it's, it's beholden upon the, the business community to start advocating for raising the welfare rates. Um, you know, it, it just, it, it's, 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 and, and, and you know, I, I think refreshingly, we heard that from a lot of businesses, that they recognize that, that the entire economy of the area is compromised by abysmally low welfare rates that don't allow, that don't allow people to shop, but actually promote misery in the community that has an exacerbating effect on all aspects of their business. So I think it's time for us to pull together, and I mean, I mean, when you look at Christy Clark and, and her campaigns and stuff, she's, well funded by the business community so you know those are the people that she's going to listen to it's not just I mean, with all respect to the activists that have been fighting hard for this we need to start making that message more mainstream and i think that's possibly one of the singular biggest things we can do through this kind of operation and i think sitsec is well poised to actually you know i heard time and time again people just don't like local businesses they're here because it's cheap they're here because they like the flavor and the the history and all these, and they got big space that they can do their operations in, but they recognize that they're in a, a, an impoverished community. They recognize that there's a lot of, uh, you know, injustice going around, and, and, and they want to 
do something meaningful, but they just don't know how. And I think there's a great opportunity to tap into that. And I think raising the rates, uh, finding social inclusion policies, and maybe bring employment and low barrier options like that. Uh, those are all tools that that we could employ to actually make this, you know, uh, something really meaningful for the community, local economy. Thanks, Pete. Um, I don't know. I think a lot, a lot of business owners end up talking to you, which I actually don't talk to a lot of them. But um, they're like, oh, but you know, I give homeless people coffee, or you know, I, there's, I give this Chinese senior money, or whatever. And that's all good, like, be nice to people in the neighborhood and support them, but uh, supporting individual members of the community is not enough. And I think it's really important that all business owners and everyone who lives in this community steps up and supports campaigns like uh, Raise the Rates. And Jean just came in here with her latest campaign. Do you want to say something about it, Jean? Sure. Jean is also at CCAP. Yeah, so... We've actually been trying and failing to get the Community Development, Development Committee to actually come out and have like a news conference or something of business people to say that the welfare rate should go up. But if we can't do that, if anybody here would like to take some of these amazing posters, we have this campaign called We Can't Afford Poverty, and it's got posters, it's got cards to sign to take to your MLA, it's got videos that are on Facebook and the We Can't Afford Poverty website, which is nopovertybc.ca. It's on a poster. And if anyone would like these posters to put up in your place of work or any other place you can think of, there's four of them. They're beautiful posters. They've been done by children in the neighborhood. The art is from children in the neighborhood at Strathcona and at the St. James Musical Place. And yeah, so... I don't know, how shall I spread these things out? No, who would like a you, can you can pass them around. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Go ahead and look at her. Pass them from table to table. <laughs> There's four of them. Thanks, Jean. Um, I think the important thing is just uh, support community groups who are fighting for justice on the Dalton East side because uh, what people want here in the community, they don't want charity, they want justice, they want higher wealth rates, they want housing, you know, just basic things like that. But, we're not going to get that through charity. And so that's really important. And other things we can do is like, don't call the cops on homeless people or go and get people in the neighborhood, you know? Uh, that's really crucial as well. And they do that a lot. So that has to change as well. Why don't we, well, I think I'd love to hear some questions from the audience. So. We need to tackle a little bit more systemic challenges such as uh, the equity and social justice components of uh, this neighborhood because if we're not able to um, solve those and resolve those or at least alleviate some of the challenges, uh, we are going to be just pitting people against each other, businesses against the community, and etc. So uh, I'm fully in support of uh, raising the rates and I think that it's, it's critical uh, that uh, we tackle some of the tougher challenges and more complex issues.